and welcome to uh, HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. And you are tuned in to another Ataya seminar. Uh, this week, we are hosting Alessio Mokamo from uh, University of Basel in Switzerland. And uh, my director, uh, Divine, will uh, shortly introduce Alessio. Um, the paper that uh, Alicia is, is the book chapter rather that Alicia is talking about concerns the idea of what is the object in African studies. This is the question, and Alicia steps through the various uh, complexities and contradictions in establishing the object of study, including ideas about science and the ways in which, in order to study Africa. Um, we, in some places, have to use systems of thought that uh, are contrary to Africa. Uh, I'm going to quote just part of a sentence. Um, there is tragedy in that the conceptual apparatus that we could draw from to recover real Africa is based on epistemological assumptions that are raised it through the power of their own discourse. So that is uh, talking about the history of colonialism and Western thought and the challenges in defining Africa within that. So that's just my very brief uh, stab at a sample of the paper and Alicia will, um, will uh, explain this to you in more detail. So thank you very much for joining us Alicia and I'm gonna hand over to Divine Fur, who is my director at Humor and he will introduce Alicia further. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, Ralph. And thank you very much, Elisio, for ac accepting to join us here. Uh, just to say that Ralph has been curating this seminar for the entire semester, and uh, we've had, you know, really a rich uh, set of conversations. And we want to thank Ralph immensely, you know, for the tremendous and really amazing work he's done. And also a fellow who was here before, uh, Fernanda. Uh, who had also helped to curate this work, but also took leave, you know. So uh, uh, just uh, some appreciation and to thank Elisio for making time. Uh, I want to say that I've known Elisio uh, since my days at the University of Basel. I did not go to Bayreuth. I, I've heard that these days we have a very strong connection to people uh, in Bayreuth. I think that uh, Azar is responsible for that and not me. Uh, but it is great to have uh, uh, a good group of people, you know, who uh, alumni of Bayreuth, you know, to be contributing, you know, to these uh, 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 sets of conversations and different spaces at, uh, at, at Humor. Uh, so uh, Elisio Makamo is a professor of African Studies and Sociology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Uh, he has written uh, about the tensions of being a sociologist in a place where you're considered to be an anthropologist uh, and what it means to be uh, to, to think the world as an African within a European space. Uh, uh, from uh, 2011 to 2018, he was director of the Center of African Studies. And uh, from 2015 to 2018, he was the head of the social science department at the same University of Basel, where I am also alumni. Uh, Elisio joined Basel when I was in Basel and when we were about to leave. And we were very excited then that uh, for once, actually, we could think African studies with a brother. Uh, his research uh, covers uh, a broad range of different subjects from everyday life. Uh, he's written about risk. In fact, when I joined Codesia as head of publications and dissemination, the first book that I published was Elysia's book on risk uh, in, in, uh, in Mozambique, which is a really fascinating book about uh, looking at different epistemologies and also ontologies of risk and how we engage uh, risk. I uh, like over the past years that argued about the fact that we need to look for six different vocabularies to describe and uh, make meaning to our everyday experiences. Uh, in recent years, he has paid attention to methodological issues in African studies, one of which he is going to be talking today. And he is the author of many, many, many books, and one of which is a book called and Reason, which is Issues in African Studies, uh, which is forthcoming in African uh, minds. Um, I should also say that if Alicia is on our board, 
and the academic uh, board, and we're looking forward to engaging him. And over the years, uh, Elisio has really also contributed enormously to nurturing and training young, younger scholars, you know, on the, the uh, African continent. So uh, it is always a pleasure. And uh, Elisio, I remember many years ago saying that uh, uh, when we were somewhere in the mountains in Basel for a workshop on governance and corruption, uh, saying that young scholars uh, should always be careful not to bite the finger that feeds them. So uh, thank you, Elisio, you know, for uh, being here. And we are looking forward to, uh, to your talk. And thank you for the generous work that you continue to do, you know, for nurturing scholars on this continent. Thank you so much, Divine. Uh, thank you to your team also, uh, to Yuma uh, for uh, giving me this space to share my thoughts uh, with you. And uh, thank you for your very kind uh, words. Now, something disturbing and yet funny happened recently in South Africa. A session of the Pan-African Parliament came to an abrupt and tumultuous end because the Africans charged with the crucial task of bringing the continent together in the spirit of the founding parents of African unity were bitterly torn over how much power and influence Francophones and Anglophones should have. I need to repeat this. African parliamentarians were bickering over identities imposed on them by colonial powers. They were not concerned about how much power Bantu, Sudanese, or even Khoisan linguistic groups should have to pursue the agenda of African unity. Now, do you see how disturbing and yet funny the whole thing is? But is it? What makes this uh, event appear disturbing and funny is an assumption underlying the pursuit of knowledge in Africa. The assumption holds that there is a phenomenon out there in the world, which we can usefully describe as Africa. It's not necessarily wrong, except that it takes two things for granted. One is Africa itself, that is an empirical reality independent of the conceptual vocabularies we deploy to render it intelligible. And the other is basically committing us to standards of truth and validation. And this potentially deny historicity to Africa. In fact, so much so that Africa becomes a residual category, the essence of which consists in what others did to us. Now, I think this incident helps us approach my topic today concerning what we study when we claim to be studying Africa. So let's uh, look again at what happened at the Pan-African Parliament. What was it? Several things come to mind. First, African parliamentarians disagreed bitterly over procedural matters. Second, African parliamentarians showed what happens when parliamentarians disagree over procedural issues. Third, the event demonstrated what happens when institutional rules are unclear or when those who should apply them don't take their job seriously or when value commitments speak louder. Fourth, the acrimonious exchange represented the likely consequence of trying to make an alien institution work in a local setting bereft of locally and culturally meaningful identity markers. Fifth, we saw the failure of liberal democracy in tropical areas inhabited by, mainly by dark-skinned people or where politics has become a way of securing one's livelihood. Now, I hope you noticed uh, three things on that list. First of all, I moved from the particular to the general, that is, from speaking about African parliamentarians to speaking about liberal democracy. Pretty much in the same way, I would have the choice of describing our gathering today as an African studies colloquium hosted by Hume, and that would be particular, 
or as a scientific gathering at a university uh, that would be general or saying me as, as Elysio and me as a sociologist. Secondly, I transformed potential explanations, that is accounts of the meaning of what happened into the things themselves. I think I should explain this. If I say that African parliamentarians disagreed bitterly over procedural matters, I'm suggesting that African parliamentarians are not what I am looking at. I am looking at the phenomenon of bitter disagreement, which in theory is a universal human trait. So the question is what uh, must uh, bitter disagreement be like, look like to qualify as African? Uh, must it have taken place among people we describe as African or somewhere in Africa? So the methodological significance of that uh, boils down to a question that is fundamental to me. What is this a case of? And that's the kind of question we don't ask often enough in African studies. And the result is that we are often unable to make our life relevant to other people's lives. And we tend to operate with essential definitions of ourselves. So I hope you notice the work of redescription I did to speak about the event. In other words, I had to appeal to ideas beyond the event itself to render it intelligible. However, I remained within the overall framework that makes any of the accounts likely. Or to put it differently, while the items on the list may come across to you as disparate, a coherent conceptual frame holds them together. And ultimately, this frame decides what we can say and what we cannot say without the risk of unintelligibility. And this is not a minor point. For example, suppose someone says the disruptions at the Pan-African Parliament were proof of Africans' inability to rule themselves. We all know there are people out there who say such things. We also say that when no one is listening, uh, now, suppose further, when you hear someone saying that, you jump from your seat and you say, that's racist. It's not that. It's, uh, the thing is that history conspired uh, to give us institutions uh, which uh, to function properly require from us the kinds of things colonialism took away from us. And you can call this particular reaction a post-colonial begging to differ because you are gesturing towards how after colonialism, statements have lost their innocence. You can have it in an even more radical way. You could reply to the person by saying again, well, that's colonial, and then go on to claim that the event does not document Africans' inability to rule themselves. Instead, it describes why Africans need to develop their institutions informed perhaps by their own culture and history. Now, let's call that uh, a decolonial begging to differ. And what you would be saying then is that to make sense of life today, we need to step outside of the colonial framework where the enlightenment and modernity rear their ugly heads constantly. None of these reactions is fundamentally disruptive of the coherent conceptual framework that produced the first utterance. The post-colonial and the decolonial begging to differ have at best offered a different account. And at worst, they have redescribed what happened without undermining that which produced the first utterance in the first place. In other words, they have left intact the assumptions rendering all of these accounts intelligible. And these assumptions hold constant a world that requires classifications of people, give pride of place to culture, defines politics in terms of regulation, authority, and legitimacy, sets limits to what can be said, and generally looks at pluralism with suspicion, and for this reason, sanctions discourse normatively. This is the reason why, if we are honest about these things, we have to acknowledge 
that we are not essentially doing anything new when we appeal to the right to differ in our rejection of accounts of our continent. Instead, we take our place in a long list of embarrassingly pale ancestors that tendered their critical wares between the 15th and 20th century in Europe with the likes of Montaigne, Montesquieu, Karl Marx, Mary Wollstonecraft, Thomas Paine, and why not even Rousseau, Mill, to Simone de Beauvoir, Foucault, Derrida, Christeva, and so on. I know these are unlikely bad fellows, uh, but there we are, merrily throwing around pillows with them. Now, the Enlightenment rested on three intellectual pillars. First, it believed in one truth. Second, it believed in one method to arrive at that truth, that is reason or rationality. And third, it thought that the solution would always yield a coherent vision of the universe once you arrived at that truth. I think post-colonialism and decolonial thought proceed in pretty much the same way. We believe that there's something fundamentally wrong about Western epistemology, but we use it to establish that. And secondly, we think that the method to find that out is uh, being angry or resisting rejection, etc. And finally, that whatever comes out of that will be a coherent world that portrays us as the victims of epistemic injustice. And our mantra becomes knowledge is political. And for this reason, we may yield easily to validating our claims normatively. So we engage in intellectual toy toying to keep people in line with the single truth that suffering at the hands of history equips us with, while at the same time endowing us with the ability to denounce those who stray from that truth. So we are looking for new answers where we should question the old assumptions that produce the questions based on which accounts of Africa were made possible. Elsewhere, I describe this uh, as the post-colonial paradox. And I mean the awkward problem of being understood by those from whose uh, bad odor or smell, to use Mudimbe's uh, expression, we are seeking to escape. Uh, so long as others can understand us, we can never be sure that we are speaking freely. For there's always the risk that what we see is only what we can see, therefore, still a function of the power of the others over us. So my solution to the problem posed by the post-colonial paradox is to suggest radical science, that is keeping our misgivings to ourselves, lest we end up showing it, uh, showing that it is not yet Uhuru. Uh, as you can immediately see, the problem with this solution is that I have to communicate it to you using the language I cannot trust to enable me to say what I want to say, not what I can see. So it's insane and perhaps even hopeless. So I hope I have done an excellent job of sowing the seeds of doubt through provocation. It's vital to the success of this presentation that you lose your confidence in your calling as a critical voice planted within the social sciences to undermine the European will to power. Whether we like it or not, it is simply not the case that we are speaking from nowhere. We are speaking from a place and that place is not our choice. Instead, that which makes it possible for us to claim a place from which to speak assigned us this place in the first place. Now, do you see how complicated the whole thing is? it really blunts the critical edge in what we say. And most of all, uh, what blunts the critical edge is a simple truth, according to which at best, all that our discursive sable rattling helps us accomplish is the creation of certain conditions. Within these conditions, we construct ourselves as spokespersons of cultural or political entities existing by the strength of the hold the coherent conceptual frames which produced us in the first place have over us. 
Thus, it's almost like we are fighting a losing game sweetened by the rewarding feeling we get of being intellectual revolutionaries in the shadow boxing exercise of landing predictable punches where it does not hurt. Now, I know I'm speaking in tongues, uh, but I think it's necessary. I need it to be uh, this uh, mysterious to impress on you the importance of realizing that, um, that uh, passing itself as uh, rebellion does not amount to much more than saying the same things using different words. It's really like uh, Apia once put it, the emperor has ordered the natives to wear clothes and these rebel by insisting on making these clothes out of their own cotton. Now, if this is the case, what hope is there that we can recover a sense of subversion in what we do as African scholars? Well, uh, that's why we are here today. I'm going to tell you. Uh, the challenge is to revisit our understanding of the object. That is what it means to say that Africa is an object. And to do that, we need to say farewell to an idea of scholarly work, which makes us interpreters of the world. We are not interpreters, but rather world makers, that is uh, crafters of concepts, positing possible worlds that we build together with others. When we complain about African parliamentarians looking ridiculous, we are not complaining about their actual behavior. We are complaining about the meanings buried deep in the conceptual vocabularies that we use uh, and which yield such images uh, of ridicule or of heroism uh, for that matter. And that is why for me, doing African studies is an exercise in the methodology of the social sciences. We don't study Africa. We can't do it because to do so is to take for granted that which will undermine our knowledge. To engage in African studies for me is to deal with the very possibility of knowledge. And that's what the methodology of the social sciences is about. And that's why the crucial question here is knowing what knowledge is. And for those of us in the social sciences, uh, well, what the social is. And so for me, knowledge is not what we know. Uh, knowledge is the way we know. Hence, the way we arrive at what we know. And the social in turn is not the world shared by people, but the effort we invest together in sustaining the illusion of knowledge. Now, this was the epistemological trick of the enlightenment. And unfortunately, uh, well, it did not discover Africa. Uh, on the contrary, it built Africa based on what it, uh, you know, what the continent was supposed to be within the framework of the colonial project. So I'm saying that the methodology of the social sciences reflects the conditions of emergence of that illusion and on the practical investment that people make in its maintenance. So pursuing African studies uh, is really asking ourselves how Africa was constituted as an object of knowledge. Now, one vital resource we need to do this properly is a clear understanding of the notion of the object. Simply put, the object is the thing toward which we direct a cognitive act. In other words, the object, as in research object, is a theory of knowledge. And again, the, the research object is not something out there that we study. It is a theory of knowledge. The object is not an empirical uh, entity. The object is a theory of knowledge which allows us to know what we can know and how we can know it. Now, such a theory of knowledge entails uh, the rules by which you render something visible, the facts you can draw uh, from to generate your statements about something, uh, and crucially, the general principles based on which you infer logical links between your opinions and the facts that you adduced. Now, Ralph Borland asked me to suggest an image for this presentation. 
And I chose a beautiful flower, Cisapinia pulcherima, also known as the peacock flower. According to an exciting book by the American historian, Londa Shibina, in, in 1701, Maria Sibylle Merle, a German Swiss naturalist, described this flower in her book and highlighted that it was an abortifacient, that is, it could be used to induce an abortion. According to Mary, slave women in the Caribbean used this flower for abortions because they told her they did not want their children to be born slaves. However, it took centuries for these properties of the flower to be publicly documented in Europe because the state powers always concerned with controlling female sexuality were betting at the time on population growth for the Grand Imperial Project. Now, I teach a course here in Basel with the title, The Sociology of the Global South, in which I try to introduce students to another way of doing and understanding sociology. The idea is to make students aware of how sociology, just like many other social science disciplines, came into being through a process I describe as the production of ignorance. Now, ignorance is not what we don't know. It is what we can no longer know because of the things we know. So this is also, and incidentally, how I approach the intellectual agenda of post-colonialism and decolonization. To keep their critical edge sharp, they must seek to rid us of the knowledge that prevents us from knowing. So in that course, I challenge students to reconstruct the questions, the claims, and the processes of validating knowledge necessary to understand the social processes that produce the world we live in. I invite them to confront what they don't know, because what they don't know does not consist of individual objects. It consists of all the things that fell out of view in the process of constructing theories of knowledge and therefore of things. Now I do this because I want students to become aware of how our, our methods of knowing are intimately linked with our ways of not knowing. And in this sense, how at times we deploy knowledge to celebrate actually our ignorance. Thus, I provoke students to reflect on the notion of representation and its other, that is misrepresentation. And the goal is not to make students cynical towards knowledge. It is to warn them to be suspicious of any claim to innocence that concepts can have. So I ask them not to take the world rendered visible by concepts for granted without first inquiring into the overall framework within which those concepts acquire their meaning. In this sense, and to come back to my initial example, maybe what happened at the Pan-African Parliament was neither disturbing nor funny. Uh, what makes it disturbing and funny is our commitment to the idea that there is a single way of being a proper African. And failing to live up to those expectations means failing to be an African. We believe uh, to be liberating ourselves, but perhaps we are simply yielding to the essential identities the colonial project gave us. Now, all this is part of the broader argument I make about African studies. There is no such thing as knowledge of Africa. Instead, what we describe as knowledge of Africa is the process through which we constitute Africa as an object. And this is what I mean when I claim that studying Africa is engaging in the gratifying work uh, entailed in the methodology of the social sciences. It is reminding ourselves that when we say that we are studying Africa, we are getting ready to do so. And hence the title of the reading circulated beforehand, before we start. Because until we have found a way of talking about ourselves, which is not hostage to that from which we seek to escape, we cannot really say that we are studying Africa. And the thing with this thought is that we may end up realizing 
But to properly study Africa, we may need to commit ourselves to doing away with it. But that's another issue, definitely not one for today. So I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Alicia. That was a beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I mean, I think part of our response to the Pan-African Parliament fracas is, uh, you know, perhaps perhaps the hopes that we're holding out for, for Pan-Africanism. And so we're disappointed when we see it um, disrupted in that way by, by, by our representatives. So, but um, a lot of our hopes and dreams are tied up with the, the idea of the success of that project. And um, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned the part of your, of your paper, which refers to the Western emperor having ordered the natives to exchange their robes for trousers, their act of defiance is to insist on tailoring them from homespun material. Because when I read that in your paper, I immediately thought of Yinka Shonebare, you know, the British Nigerian artist who makes wax print fabric, his material for his artwork. And I thought about that fabric. And so, you know, and, you know, perhaps I, I in my mind, I gave the trousers uh, a pattern and, you know, imagined what fabric those trousers were made out of. And I thought about the history of that fabric, that it's, you know, made in Holland to imitate Indonesian batik. Uh, wasn't popular there and became very popular in West Africa. And now it's seen as a symbol of African identity. So I think to add to that, that, that notion in which um, imported goods can become owned by other people and how they, they can become actually expressions of, uh, of identity there as well. So thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure we're all, um, we're all in need of a lift of our spirits. Um, we all, you know, those of us who saw it happen earlier. And um, yeah, I think that we should, we should all try and like, uh, and lift our spirits now and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy what Alicia has, uh, has given us today. So thank you very much. Um, I think Divine is going to manage the, uh, the questions. Yes, I'm here. I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, if people uh, raise their arms, then I will unmute them. I mean, just a security measure to ensure that uh, uh, we do not go back to where we came from. Yes. Yes. So if, if you have a question, please just raise your hands and I will unmute you. Yeah. So if anybody would like to um, contribute material or ask a question of Alicia, that would be welcome. And uh, welcome, Lisa Godson. I see that you've uh, you've joined us, and Lisa is our next week's uh, speaker. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Could you could you um could you explain again about the flower that uh, that you mentioned, Alicia? Because I found that fascinating. You know, I, we 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 didn't know what it uh, what it represented beyond being a uh, a beautiful flower, and you explained it just now as an as an abortive. Yes, it is. Thank you for that. It, it's an an abortive, and the thing that fascinated me about it is, um, you know, the set of circumstances under which. Uh, it came to our attention. So uh, it was discovered by this uh, German Swiss woman and uh, she wrote about it and uh, she brought it back to Europe, uh, actually to the university, uh, to the botanical garden at the University of Leiden uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, this was not made public in Europe. Uh, because there was the fear that if it is made public, that women might want to use it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, so the, the link I was um, establishing there was with the notion of ignorance, you know, of um, uh, all the things that we don't know uh, because of the things we know. And uh, so, I mean, I think that... Uh, 
uh, a lot of the things we don't know about Africa are because of the things we know about Africa. That is about how our knowledge of Africa is constructed. And yeah. so I think that instead of taking for granted the vocabulary that we use, we should critically engage with it. And that is why I uh, defend the view that we are not yet studying Africa and we shouldn't. Uh, we should be concerned with the ways of studying Africa. And that, that is actually the contribution that we can make to scholarship as yes. Africans, whatever that means. Yes. Mamadou, up. Yeah. yeah, let's uh, let's pass over to, uh, to I, I just wanted to mention it sounds also about eight, like it's about agency and technology as well. The example of the flower, right. you know, who, who is given agency to use the available, you know, technology. Yeah. But um, thank you very much. I'm going to let's hear from Mamadou, please. Uh, so thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Elisio, and uh, thanks for having resisted to this attack. And uh, I think these were the right way uh, further. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, these are, um, uh, the first one is uh, about ignorance. Uh, could you comment on this very dense um, expression of yours, the production of ignorance? This would be the first question. The second one is related to uh, what you called um, the answer to post-colonial paradox or to decolonial paradox. The only answer is radical science. What do you mean with radical science? And what do you mean with radical science as answer to two, um, two theses or two ways of dealing with Africa which seem to be contradictory uh, or which presented themselves as contradictory. So this post-colonial and this decolonial, and you have only one answer to both, it's radical science. Mm. Oh, uh, thank you, Grandfrey. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, I think you, you, you've spotted the problem. Uh, this is really uh, the main problem. Uh, that I am trying to deal with, uh, but also uh, I am trying to, um, to suggest as the main uh, challenge in our intellectual agenda as uh, uh, scholars of Africa. So uh, this idea of ignorance, um, I mean, it's used in many different ways. Uh, for example, in development policy, uh, it is used uh, to describe uh, the way in which uh, in indigenous knowledge or local knowledge is uh, simply sidelined. So all of a sudden, what you know loses relevance uh, because of all the things that are coming into your, into your livelihood, into, into your local uh, settings. So there is that sense, uh, but also uh, the sense of uh, you know, how uh, certain institutions that wield power uh, actively uh, do things uh, to prevent people from knowing, uh, from knowing certain things. Now, the, the way I am using it here is very specific. I am saying uh, that we are heirs to a conceptual vocabulary in the social sciences, uh, and we assume that that conceptual vocabulary gives us tools that allow us uh, to make descriptions of the world and perhaps even to analyze uh, the world. What we don't realize uh, is that often these uh, uh, conceptual vocabularies, uh, they carry with them a normative load. Uh, which speaks to the conditions of emergence of those vocabularies, of those concepts, such that when we deploy them to speak about Africa, we are basically describing Africa uh, the way 
that normative outlook expects us to do it. So we do have a problem here uh, that uh, we, we, we cannot be sure that the concepts that we are using uh, are objective enough uh, to allow us uh, to produce uh, objective and value-free descriptions of our, uh, of our content. So it's almost like uh, we are fighting a losing battle uh, in the sense uh, that every time we appeal to this language, uh, we inscribe ourselves uh, within the general framework of epistemology or Western epistemology, as we like to say, yeah? And therefore, to be critical doesn't really sound convincing uh, because we are still within the boundaries uh, of that uh, normative uh, and descriptive uh, conceptual uh, vocabulary. So uh, I say then, I suggest then that probably the best response we can have uh, to this is to keep silent, is to simply not say anything. Uh, because if we say anything and that thing is understood by other people uh, who are deeply ingrained in this vocabulary, uh, then we have not escaped uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, from the chains uh, of, that, uh, uh, of that vocabulary. Uh, so that's why I suggest this uh, radical, uh, you know, I say, you know, the best response to this is radical science. But of course, this is all a fiction. Uh, I don't mean it uh, in a literal sense. Uh, what I mean to say is that there is work which we are not doing and we should be doing. And that work is really uh, not to take Africa for granted because the view we have of Africa is not the view we want to have of Africa. Uh, uh, because we can only think Africa using that language uh, which makes us suspicious of the descriptions that you can produce uh, with that. And so that's why I say, uh, for me, African studies is methodology of the social sciences, because it's really a reflection on the conditions of possibility uh, of knowledge. And I think for the time being, that's all we can do. So that's, uh, that's, and I don't make any distinction, uh, any uh, strong distinction as far as that is concerned between post-colonialism and decoloniality, because I think they both uh, face uh, the problem of having to uh, speak what they want to speak using that vocabulary. Thank, thank you very much, Alicia, and thank you, Mamadou. Um, I'm going to, Turn to our other questions that we have here. Um, so, uh, Lamin, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, you're still muted, but um, I think Divine will manage. Yes, there you are. Is, is it unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, hello, hi. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Makamo, for that uh, very enlightening uh, talk. And um, it just kept me wondering sort of as, as sort of like young scholars, how do we, because you're, you're sort of talking about sort of dabbling in these conceptions and sort of like trying to break away from them. And oftentimes like for, for a lot of us, the only way to build I guess my first question is like building credibility through showing our understanding and mastery of those conceptions is so important to like just getting our papers and just the basic putting our name out there and things like that. And, and, and then also I, I was thinking about, because you're talking about the ways of knowing and I, and I was sort of thinking about the, the limitations and the sort of like confinement of like trying to do research in Africa and, and, and sort of how do you get to talk to different community members? How do you um, sort of break away from certain established 
research networks, you know, and, and these sorts of like regular modes of like going to particular institutions, talking to particular individuals, like, like even just like materially breaking from a lot of that is just so difficult. Um, so I just, I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on, on this. No, that's a great, uh, a, a great intervention, Lamin. Uh, you are spot on there. I think the, the challenge here, and, and, and you described it very well, uh, is that, you know, when we go through this ritual of learning, we are also going through a ritual of unlearning, right? It happens to everyone, not just to Africans. It happens to every person who, you know, engages in social science studies and so on. But of course, uh, because of our particular historical situation, uh, that ritual uh, is particularly challenging uh, for us. Now, what I am saying uh, is that, of course, we have to do that. Uh, we have to learn uh, to speak about ourselves using that language, right? But we also need to be aware of the risks of doing that. And I think we are particularly well placed as African scholars uh, to turn our work, you know, our scholarly work uh, into, well, a reflective exercise, right? On, um, on, on, on the relevance, adequacy, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, usefulness even of this way of world making. Uh, this way of uh, thinking about the world, of making the world, of producing uh, the world. That's our opportunity. And uh, um, I mean, this is something, um, you know, Mamadou Jawara is here, and uh, uh, Augusta Eman is also here, who was here at the beginning. And we are, we, we've got this pilot postgraduate academy of African studies, which is based at Kwansut. Uh, Mamadou Jawara is the director of that institution in Bamako. And what we are trying to do is precisely this, uh, to take African scholars away from policy research. And we're not saying that people shouldn't do policy research or applied research. They can still do it. And, and I mean, the majority will still do it, but that we should also have enough people engaging in that kind of reflection. Uh, enough people thinking about the tools with which we produce our continent. So that's, uh, that's it. And uh, I, I think I, I'm glad you mentioned your, your age uh, status, uh, because I think this is what you, you know, younger scholars should be doing uh, today. And uh, if I may say this, I know it's controversial and polemical, uh, it's too easy. It's, too, it's really too easy uh, to start repeating, echoing post-colonial and decolonial uh, stuff, uh, right? And you, 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 you can easily get the impression that you are right about a lot of things, you know, simply by using that kind of vocabulary, uh, you know, uh, knowing when to shout at somebody, you know, when to say somebody is racist and so on. It's so easy, but there's something much more fundamental beyond that. And that is the work we do uh, to uh, reflect on the usefulness and relevance of the conceptual vocabularies we use. We need to do that. And I think that's, that's you who should be doing that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Alessio. And uh, thank you, Lamin, for your for your question. I'm uh, I'm in the dark here, as you might have noticed if you see my video. <laughs> so I've literally switched from my batteries run out in my router. My uh, cell phone my cell phone light is now what I'm using. So um, if I disappear, something like that might have happened. So we're gonna we're going to uh, 
move to Asif for uh, Asaf for a, for his question, and um, I think that uh, Francis Nyamjo also has has a question. So perhaps uh, after Francis, so Asaf, and then Francis, and then we might wrap this uh, wrap this up uh, if there aren't any more. But uh, yeah, loving it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Elizio. I'm sorry, I came in the middle of the talk, so I struggled to get in. So I didn't know exactly what was going on. So anyways, um, Professor Elizio, is there room to use post-colonial and coloniality um, in social science, so to say? Because I use some of these theories to look at Portuguese migration to Angola. And uh, in some cases, uh, I would say it makes sense to me to use that kind of, especially the question of coloniality, the idea that colonial legacy is still very much part of this migration, so to say. Or now I'm working on a paper with a colleague from Portugal and uh, we comparing Portuguese migrants in Angola and Angola migrants in Portugal. Funny enough, the Portuguese migrants, uh, the Angola migrants in Angola in Portugal are well-skilled, but uh, completely devalued. So my question then is, um, could you say in some cases it's possible to use post-colonial or coloniality, so to say, uh, without necessarily be angry, the way you put it, so to say? <laughs> <laughs> so that would be my question. Thank you again. Okay, okay. thank you, Asa. Um, no, I think you are right. Uh, and, and maybe I, I exaggerated. Uh, uh, in the way that I put uh, things here. I'm definitely not saying that uh, these perspectives are not useful in any way or in any sense uh, that we should abandon them. I don't think so. Uh, I would describe my own work as uh, you know, something that's informed uh, by the insights produced within those traditions of, of thought or within those uh, perspectives. I think it's useful uh, to approach whatever you are studying, uh, always uh, having in mind uh, that um, there is a specific, uh, if you like, um, um, uh, there's a specific moment uh, that produced what you are studying. And that, that moment, as uh, uh, post-colonialism claims, is the colonial uh, moment, or uh, if you like, it's modernity as uh, decolonial uh, perspectives uh, would claim. But I think that's useful uh, because it uh, helps you uh, to see things which you might not see uh, if uh, you, know, you are not aware uh, of what those perspectives are saying. So that's not an issue here. I think uh, you can still do it uh, and you can profit, your work can profit uh, from, uh, from that. But I think we need to go beyond that. And, th and that, is, that is the challenge. And that is what is very difficult uh, to accomplish. I know you are a geographer. And uh, uh, two years ago, uh, I, I attended a, uh, you know, the, the uh, conference, the Congress of uh, German Geography uh, in Kiel, up north in Germany. Um, and then, uh, some uh, German geographers came to me and they said, uh, look, uh, we want to do an excursion uh, in Africa, uh, but uh, you know, uh, we are from here, you know, students and so on, and it doesn't sound right. Uh, so, uh, you know, because they cannot come here to do excursions, you know, it's, it's not right. So how, you know, what would you advise us to do from a post-colonial perspective? And I said, don't go, just don't go. Or, you know, what's, what's a post-colonial perspective there? You're dealing with a practical matter. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with doing that, there is no concept that is going to help you out of that. You know, so uh, what I'm saying is that we should be pragmatic about these things, but we should also recognize that there's a lot of work to be done. That every time we are confronted with that difficulty, 
it's actually an opportunity to do something. And what you are doing, you are doing it for science. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Alicia. I just wanted to check, uh, does Francis Nyamjo want to ask his question live? Um, uh, I sorry, I'm, I'm live by microphone, but not by, uh, I'm in the dark. Uh, ESCOM <laughs> has kept me in the dark. Me too. But I can, I can connect. Uh, 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 Elicio, I, I, I love your recommendation of uh, uh, silence as a way of going about these things. And uh, I would really love to embrace that. And I think I still have some life ahead of me to do a scholarship as a specialist on silence. Do, do, do you think uh, if I had a CV that was perfected in silence on these issues, universities would uh, have a job for me and possibly uh, uh, accommodate me in, in a context where the only thing they know is noise? <laughs> Somehow I knew you would ask that, Francis. Uh, <laughs> but, but you see, uh, you know, the simple answer to your question is, uh, you know, to worry about uh, being accommodated by a university, that's very colonial, uh, right? And you need to get rid of that. Uh, you need to emancipate yourself from that. But of course you are right, uh, Francis. Uh, and like I said, in response to Mamadou, uh, I don't mean this in a literal sense. Uh, I mean it in a metaphorical sense. I use the, this idea of silence uh, simply to uh, point out that there is a deep epistemological problem uh, in our belief uh, that uh, you know, if we say this is colonial, this is racist, this is this and that, you know, we are somehow speaking from a place outside of that which allows us to speak. And we need to address that. We need to find creative ways of dealing with that. And, I, you know, I have this hope. I haven't found the solution yet. Uh, and maybe I will never find it. But I have the hope that that's probably the greatest contribution we are going to make to our disciplines. Uh, because I do believe that uh, at the end of the day, what we are doing is actually contributing uh, to improving, uh, you know, how we know things. So improving our disciplines, theoretically, conceptually, and methodologically. And that uh, history has given us actually a beautiful chance, uh, a golden opportunity uh, to do that. That's where the challenge uh, lies uh, for us. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, that's why I also have to, you know, I cannot keep quiet. I have to, uh, to say it uh, uh, so that uh, uh, I can make room uh, for, uh, for myself, uh, perhaps even as an expert on silence. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much both for that exchange. And uh, we have two questions, and could I could I ask um, that both uh, Ibrahima and Andrea put on their videos, if they are able to, just so we can uh, see them on the on the videos. Um, Ibrahima, you're uh, you're first. Um, would you like to ask your question? So I I would like to to ask uh, Elisio. So, so how to, to, to think or, or rethink Africa when the, the African reading on, <clears throat> on Africa is preceded by, by another discourse that interposes uh, itself uh, between the African subject and, and its object. When, when mostly Africa is the object and, and not the, the, the subject of the discourse that, that concern it. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a hard question, uh, Ibrahima. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the challenge uh, which uh, I think we face. And, and I was trying here in my own words uh, to lay down. Um, I, I think that one thing that we have to do uh, is not to take Africa for granted. 
but this is this is not new. This is stuff that other people have done before. I think mm -hmm. Odimbe has done that, uh, right, in his invention of Africa. Uh, so uh, there are a few leads that we can follow uh, in that. But the second thing uh, is not just, you know, not to take Africa for granted, but it's to, uh, you know, contemplate the possibility that at the end of the day, what we are doing is actually killing off Africa as an object. I mean, why should we have it, right? Uh, why do we insist on that? Uh, why can't it be us, right? Why can't it be us rejecting those categories? And I don't know, uh, speaking, uh, you know, using universal categories. You know, why, why, why can't we impose uh, a view of the world uh, that is not shaped by such compartmentalized uh, categories, uh, schemes, classifications, but, uh, you know, why, why can't we, we be the citizens of the world? Not Africans, but citizens of the world. On account also, of the way we have experienced history, you know. So that's these are the ideas I am toying uh, uh, with, fully aware of how challenging and difficult the whole thing is. Thank you very much, Alicia and uh, Ibrahima. And our last question is from uh, Andrea Casatella. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. It's good to see you again. Uh, um, so very thought provoking uh, uh, um, presentation. So I mean, I mean uh, what I particularly like is, I mean, you, you raise questions that are at the, at, at the very heart of what is knowledge, what is knowledge formation uh, through the particular standpoint. And so one, one, uh, one thing that has been, uh, uh, came up to my mind is in, in, in which language is this critical operation to be carried out? Uh, there is a risk of staying within the box, yeah. right? And, and, and so I was wondering, uh, uh, and I think you're gesturing towards the other possibility in your last response to, uh, to Ibrahim, I think, uh, saying that why don't, you know, that, that there's possibility of using maybe other category like lenses or grammars, conceptual grammars through which to look at the world. And so I was wondering also say, if, 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 you're, radic if you're doing a radical, you're going to the roots, Maybe there is also something that might go beyond. So maybe something that can be in translation between language, but also that goes beyond language. And so it, it involves the body. And that would be a challenge to the social science that, that would be difficult to sustain for the social science. Maybe the humanities can do that, but I just, I just wanted to put it out there. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Andrea. And great to see you here. Uh, you know, I think you are spot on. Uh, I, I like what you said now. Uh, because uh, it's something that didn't cross my mind. Uh, the, you know, I was insisting on looking for a solution to this problem uh, through language, using language. Uh, but of course, we can have a broader understanding of language, you know, as a tool for communication. And then we have other things. And uh, honestly, I don't see any reason why we should not contemplate that, uh, right? Because like I say, this is the opportunity that we have. This is our chance. Uh, so yes, uh, I mean, maybe there are uh, ways of seeking our liberation uh, that will not go through language. Uh, we'll have to find other media uh, for that. Now, having said that, uh, I, I believe that there is potential that in language that we have not yet fully explored. So for example, you, you see, we, we, we have the fortunate uh, situation. I mean, when I say we, I always mean Africans. We have this fortunate uh, 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 situation that, you know, we are bilingual, right? But in a radical way, yeah? So bilingual in the sense that we speak 
uh, two radically different languages. You know, so my mother tongue is Tsonga, the Bantu language, right? And the official language in my country is Portuguese, uh, you know, a Romance language. They're, they're radically different. So one thing that uh, I've started doing in the past two years is actually to, to translate the concepts of sociology into my own language. Uh, and the idea there uh, is not simply to find the appropriate translation uh, for that. The idea uh, is to reflect on the difficulty of doing that and then say, what does this mean? There's a, there's a, a fascinating podcast uh, in Germany. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was started by universities in Germany uh, that offer African languages. Uh, and uh, so they, they are, they've got a project, they call it uh, recalibrating Africanistic. Africanistic in German uh, is the name that African linguistics, linguistics has. And so they are doing that. And what they do, uh, you know, they invite people, they throw out a question and then they invite people uh, to give an answer to that question in three minutes, right? Uh, it could be any question. So for example, one question that they asked was, you know, if you had money, right? Uh, and you, 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 you know, you are responsible for, for African languages. What other disciplines would you like to work with? Right? Uh, where would you put your money? Right? And so they invited me to do that. And what I did, Andrea, was to, to give the response in my language in Tsonga, right? That's what I did. Uh, and what I found myself doing was basically translating sociology and English into my language, right? And, and, and so, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure that uh, Tsonga speakers in Mozambique educated Tonga speakers in Mozambique would understand what I said without any translation into Portuguese, right? And so, uh, you know, I think there is unexplored potential in our languages. We need to do that, uh, right? Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, Europeans did that a long time ago because uh, you know, like we often complain, oh, we have to do uh, science in an alien language. But for many years, hundreds of years, all Europeans, in order to do uh, science, uh, they had to, you know, do it in Latin or in Greek, uh, right? So th this situation is not particularly new, yeah. But we need to go through that. I think that's a great question. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Andrea. And that brings us uh, to the close of the seminar. And uh, to say thank you to Alicia, that was a virtuoso demonstration of oratorical skills, <laughs> um, grappling with the thorny question of what is the object in African studies. And we've moved from tussles at the Pan-African Parliament through trousers of homespun fabric and perhaps wax print <laughs> through to flowers uh, with special purposes um, and through to many interesting questions from some esteemed uh, discussants as well. So thank you. Um, this has been a seminar from Humor, the Institute for Humanities in Africa. Um, thank you to everyone here who bore with us and who participated in this. Uh, second, uh, second phase. Um, next week's speaker is Lisa Godson from the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. Um, and she's talking about the speculum, uh, the gynecological instrument and the way that its origins are mired in a history of slavery, empire and the oppression of women. 
Um, and uh, Lisa has been studying this for many, uh, many years, and she's drawing widely on different uh, areas of study, particular ma material cultures. Uh, she'll be sharing some of her work that's part of the, the uh, upcoming VNA exhibition. So that is next week. And I, I, th I also thought there were some interesting links through uh, from Alicia's presentation, especially that flower. So thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Divine. Thank you to my colleagues. And uh, thanks all. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Alicia and uh, colleagues. And uh, so 